Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is our uh, first, and I guess you can only have one kickoff call. So th this is the one uh, for everyone who's joined the uh, OSLC member section. Uh, we're, we're glad you're here with us. Uh, and for those who are interested, uh, uh, thanks for listening in as well. And uh, we look forward to providing opportunities for, for all to explore. Let's uh, transition on to the next chart here. And just I want to say both welcome, but congratulations, and thank you uh, for your interest, uh, for the participation that uh, you've uh, had already with OSLC, and uh, the promise of more. And in fact, that promise is why we're having this kickoff session. It's not just to draw attention to things that we've um, all done in the past, but looking forward to more opportunities uh, to strengthen uh, the value that OSLC is providing, bringing people together, but also delivering uh, useful technology. And you see here a broad cross-section. We have tool vendors, uh, tool users from a range of industries, system integrators. Uh, you see researchers and open source projects here as well. Um, that breadth um, is necessary for us to be able to do the kinds of things uh, collectively that we need to do to see the different uh, concerns and cares um, and also then be able to provide solutions that are that are really hitting the mark. So. This is a great start, and uh, treating it as a start again is the right way. There's opportunity for more to join, and we look forward to that uh, happening over time. So our agenda for today is, is here, and we have just a set of parts. Uh, the first is I'll go through a quick introduction of the steering committee members just to enumerate who we are. Um, we'll then transition. Um, Mick Kirsten will lead a discussion on the uh, vision that the steering committee has, has put together on where OSLC is and is going. I think Steve Spiker will contribute to that as well and, and jump in here in the next uh, conversation um, where we'll show this plan that we've put together on creating technical committees. It's the next step uh, for us after the member section uh, is created. So we're at that place, and now we need to create uh, the, the set of technical committees. From that, we'll explore um, opportunities to participate and uh, a range of possibilities there before transitioning on to Q&A. And as Sean mentioned, if there's questions that arise uh, while we're presenting that are critical to be inserted, you can um, put them in the chat uh, or, or possibly voice them. So let's go ahead now and introduce uh, the steering committee members. Just as a point here, this notion of having a member section steering committee is a part of what OASIS defines uh, for their member section. So we have this group of uh, members, and I thought I would just go through and enumerate who we are, all, who we all are, uh, as a beginning. Um, we could actually do introductions uh, in depth here, but. I know many of us have, have shared our perspectives and why we're involved in the past, so I'm just going to say um, and enumerate the names and uh, companies that are worked for. Uh, Ryan Rarsch from Siemens, Andreas Keis from EADS, Bo Levertibi from Creative Intellect, David Ingram from Accenture, Mick Kirsten from Tastop, and John Wiegan, that's myself from IBM. And so we are the steering committee. Um, we have been uh, working as a steering committee for a year, but we've only had one meeting as an OASIS steering committee. We're just getting uh, rolling in that regard. And we have two more staff members that I want to draw attention to that are critical to our uh, success up till now and ongoing success. Um, Sean Kennedy supports, he's the operation coordinator, and he supports the steering committee and the community. So things that um, need to be done, organizing meetings, seeing um, a range of homework assignments uh, that get projected. Uh, Sean works through those uh, and, and takes a lead on uh, making sure things happen and take place, connect up to the interesting people. And Steve Spiker is our technical coordinator. He's the technical liaison to the, the various work groups and the technical activities that are going on, and he's valuable to the steering committee because he gives us uh, technical guidance and in, insight. We'll ask for a technical perspective on things. You know, we're technical ourselves, but being able to tap into uh, Steve's insight and uh, even closer connection to some of the activities is helpful 
to us. So Steve plays that uh, technical coordinator, technical liaison role. Right. Very good, John. This is uh, this is Sean Kennedy, and I'm going to hijack your chart here. And there actually will be another person added to the steering committee, and that will be someone from uh, OSLC member section supporting entity, and that election should be complete by the end of June. And so maybe I'll just take a minute and uh, or or two and take a look at what what news we have about that election, share it with people here now, and uh, also again invite invite questions at this point. If you um, if you type it into the chat, Steve will relay them, or if you need to come off mute to ask your question, it's star six. So who could who could run in the election? Basically any person from a member section supporting entity. Probably you would pick one from your organization, your company, your or, or whatever to run because each organization can only have one person on the steering committee anyway. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to run two and split the votes. Um, each supporting entity will get one vote. So this isn't a one person, one vote, but one organization, one vote. And uh, the qualified elector is either your, um, your primary rep at OASIS, or if that uh, person has designated um, designated uh, someone else who's going to be more active inside the member section, uh, there are established procedures for transferring that uh, um, that responsibility to a different person within the same organization. So the nomination period, it needs to be at least 14 days ahead of the start of the election. Uh, and I believe because Thursday, July 4th happens to be a holiday in the U.S., OASIS staff is planning to uh, open the nomination period ahead of that time. So keep a eye on your email for uh, that to happen. And then the election period is also 14 days and will run from July 18th to July 31st, uh, meaning that we will know who the elected candidate is by the 1st of August. And uh, this will be a one-year term on this, uh, so that in 2014, the, this um, elected candidate, as well as Dave Ingram and Bola Rutibi, those three seats will be up for election again. At that time, it'll be for a two-year term. And in 2015, the other four seats will be up for election as a two-year term. And so you'll see that we have basically half the steering committee seats up for election uh, every year. And that's basically uh, how it works. Uh, the process for doing nominations and elections are, is well-defined uh, and well-known at OASIS. I think if you have questions on that, I would suggest you direct that to your primary rep or to uh, OASIS staff who will be very happy to help with that. So if there are questions at this time, we can take them. Uh, otherwise, we can continue on. I'm guessing there are no questions. So Mick, what's, what's this vision? All right. So, yeah, in terms of vision, I think we've you know, I think the motivation is understood by most of the folks who have joined this call, which is the fact that for the software life cycle, we need integration to be easier, to be more prevalent, um, and we need to move towards, you know, both architectures within our organizations, application life cycle management stacks, and relations and connections between vendors to be much more, much more easy and much more connected than they are today. So there's been numerous efforts around that happening over the course of the last five years where it became more clear that the, that the life cycle stack um, became more fragmented. So whether it was the advent of open source tools or commodity issue trackers or you know, the ever-changing landscape of CM or continuous integration tools and just the amount of specialization that happened with uh, agile planning tools and, and the, and, and as well as, you know, this new breed of enterprise ALM tools, uh, we needed, we needed a new solution. And some de facto implementations formed that, that were able to connect some of parts of the life cycle. So, you know, my experience with tools like, like, a, like a smile in and, and solutions built on top of that, such as the task up tools. But while all of this was forming, uh, we started having conversations with IBM about a better future where things were wired up. You know, you did not have to create a, a large amount of implementation just to connect either 
life cycle tool to life cycle tool or life cycle tool to your other internal uh, ALM tool or, or part of your enterprise application stack, um, or just tool to tool if you were, if you're a life cycle tool vendor. And that was happening around 2009, 2010. So OSLC launched with, with the, the stack of governance from IBM, uh, as well as for, for participation from a number of vendors, including Tasta. Uh, we realized that there was opportunity to do more here. Uh, the, you know, the set of protocols, the, the set of models that was, that was being created in OSLC, uh, would have far further reaching effects, and the steering committee was formed in 2012. So this enabled us to basically have a more vendor neutral look at the direction of OSLC, and in the end, what that created was the, the drive to move o- OSLC onto OASIS, onto a standards body, to basically take the technology that they've incubated, the standards that they've incubated, that some of the technology that they've incubated to move on, on Eclipse, things like the LEO project, uh, to now a standards body where these standards could evolve and continue to grow their support for the different integration needs of the life cycle and continue to support implementations on them, whether those implementations are tools that build on OSLC so they become, they come with an integration layer out of the box or integration layers in themselves, such as you know, life cycle uh, integration frameworks, life cycle integration infrastructure tools. And that's where we are today. We're very excited that, uh, with this, with this kickoff, we're now on Oasis and that the discussion around the additional needs for integrators, for vendors, for IT organizations needing to connect the lifecycle stack uh, will be happening now on Oasis. So just quickly, why this matters. You know, we've got this software running the world. Um, the world is, is as, as I mentioned, is heterogeneous and disjoint. So we've, we've basically got specialization either among vendors, we've got competition between vendors, we've got legacy solutions that are not changing and these traditional approaches to integrating software have just have not worked as well as we might have expected. Um, basically, the integration layers offered by one vendor for another have just not have not been sufficient, and there's been a lack of standards. So at least if you look at the application development tools, uh, if you look at some of the ways there's been connectivity in the application development stack, it, there's there. You know, at least at a very basic level, things interoperate as files. You can consume and compile and do things with files and package them up and put them into your application as various third-party tools can understand. We've not even had that level of file interoperability in the software lifecycle. Most issue trackers, for example, don't support export of something like a file. Formats like RecIF have, have not really taken uh, in this new set of lifecycle tools. So we've, we basically, we've gone to this, this very bad problem in terms of just even a basic level of interoperability between tools, and this has a very high cost. It means whenever you're trying to integrate a stack, whenever you're trying to include tools from multiple vendors who potentially could be competing, you're just raising your TCO. You're taking on that integration burden yourself. And as we've seen in the past, open standards are these key enablers for this broad adoption and for integration layers to be built, again, either within tools or, or across tools. So the whole idea with OSLC is to provide these standards to simplify this lifecycle integration problem, and which in the end, leads to cost savings because you can't deliver an application without some kind of integrated lifecycle. And if your lifecycle has manual steps in it, it slows down the application delivery. If you've created your own integration layer within your organization, it's just added to the cost of the application and reduced your flexibility. So again, those are the the very high-level goals. And so basically making the world of software delivery run more efficiently, efficiently and providing this base layer of standards for everyone to build on, everyone in integration to build on. So... The goal is a foundational technology for integrations and a set of, of, of common protocols and common architectural guidelines, uh, such as link data, which, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, to become the, the leader in terms of integration uh, standards and this natural choice for standardizing new integrations for, for, for domains that are adjacent to the life cycle as well. So, for example, if there's need to link to a, a project and performance management tool and the life cycle tool, the idea is that the set of protocols, the set of, of, of um, resource definitions are uh, sufficient for that or will be extended to uh, support integration with, with related domains in terms of the life cycle. In terms of the technical vision uh, for OSLC, you know, the idea is to build on the architecture of the web in 
but especially building on this notion of this, this length data vision. So anyone who's not seen uh, Tim Berners the uh, descriptions of that, and, and, and she's got a short TED podcast that you can watch on it. Um, the idea is to be able to connect up these resources on the web, even though they exist in, in multiple servers. So you've got, we've got a protocol that's more rich at the base of this, that's more rich than just being able to point at URLs. And you might have noticed a lot of the tools that you use today, all they're able to do is basically point at another artifact and another tool at the URL and have no information about that URL. You don't know, for example, what's at the end of that URL, whether there's different status that can't query across it. So it's really elevate um, this integration architecture, which is just, just, just URL-based and, and very fragile and, and uh, with not enough information going across those boundaries between repositories to this linked data architecture where things can be say, queried across repositories and uh, data can flow from one from one tool into another. For example, um, data flowing from a, a defect from one tool to uh, a user interface component in another tool or to a report in another tool and going across repositories. So all of this is building a, um, on the uh, this linked data architecture, and again, you know, with the same values where you've got additional traceability, you're able to link these different systems, you're able to link them, in the case of OSLC, across the life cycle, because that's what we care about. So across, you know, CI tools and monitoring reporting tools, quality management, defect tracking tools, requirements management, and change management into this, basically, this, this connected graph that users can look at and understand the structure of their life cycle, whatever the role, and that tools can also leverage. For example, if data needs to flow from another tool, either into an interface or into a repository, a uh, reporting tool, that can happen over these um, over these connections that OSLC builds on. And Steve, is there anything that you want to add in terms of the sort of the architectural goals uh, since you've been one of the people leading these efforts? No, I think that I think they add on a couple things. I mean, the, the some of the core problems we've we've worked with in the past and, and tool integration is. You know, being able to uh, identify, link to, and learn about other artifacts and other tools. And so, as you mentioned, there's the the previous way is being able to connect directly to that tool, being able to then search and find based on some identification system. So this approach, you know, is taking it to the to the global, you know, web scale of being able to both identify and, and locate these different resources. So, and and this other point was. Uh, so that provides a, a good open, scalable system, which allows us to connect even beyond uh, what we think of as a traditional uh, kind of tool-to-tool -tool software development uh, interoperability. Uh, in addition, just a, a point on also is the general philosophy and how we're working and have worked in OSLC around um, this uh, specification motivated by um, scenarios and how we evolve um, the to the specifications to, to meet that is is that that continues with that same model as we move forward within the OASIS structure as well. And so I'll speak briefly to that on the organizational vision for OSLC. So this, there are a few different moving parts that you may have seen already. Um, so I, I mentioned that there's so we've got the, the, the linked data work happening on the W3C um, working group. Um, the standards were approved, and those are part of what OSLC core with our standards build, up, build on. Um, the collaboration will be happening now uh, with an OASIS. So the working groups, the steering committee right now, are actually just focused entirely on OASIS, um, while there's content uh, remains on openservices.net. And uh, Steve, maybe you can also you know, give a quick summary of that and just mention how the Bitcoin Steel project fits in, which is a project that's intended to make it very easy for organizations to pick up and you, you know, pick up a TCK for if they're implementing some of these standards. Uh, so for example, you know, at TASCAP we use the Leo TCKs you know, to make sure that our tools, our, all of our tools, uh, are OSLC compliant, all of our uh, lifecycle interoperability tools. But you don't just uh, fill in any blanks on the organizational structure and uh, and the vision. Uh, I think I think that's good. The Eclipse Leo port is the you know primary place you would go to look for for helping you yourself out with with integration. But of course, there's you know, open source grows and exists in a lot of different places. And, and for your .NET developers, there's the OSLC for net uh, .codeplex.net is a uh, uh, codeplex .org. Uh, uh, at, where you can go find uh, uh, various other assets for those type of integrations. So yeah, there's a, a wide variety of things in, in growing an active community there. Uh, 
Uh, so with that, are there any uh, questions on uh, anything that Steve and I covered in terms of the um, the vision for OSLC and where we are at right now in terms of the organizational vision as well? Uh, I just might uh, add in that the W3C Link Data Platform Work Group, you know, we're we're uh, very active in working towards uh, uh, progressing that specification onto where their status of a as a last call, putting out for further. Uh, comments and review, so we're looking at that's uh, evolving and maturing as well. And one other point, I just under the general community aspects of, of OpenDeskServices.net is there's there's a construct we have out there as well, which is a, a way to pull together a group of people who are interested in, in Possibly eventually getting to a specification, but really want to talk about some some various uh, integration topics. So we have a construct called user groups, which can help um, pull together a, a number of people. We have those today under um, systems engineering, under uh, mobile. Um, so uh, th those constructs exist as well. So the non-propeller heads, if you will. Does that exclude you, Steve? <laughs> but, um, so yeah, the, the whole idea here is that it's as easy as as we can possibly make it for you to get involved both in the definition of the standards and the evolution, but also consuming them. Uh, I think you know both Leo and some of these, you know, for example, implement the textbooks are an example of that. That that both for 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 potential contributors, uh, those interested and in, you know the vendors interested. Um, the organizations interested in, in pushing this forward, and those ones interested in getting the, you know, what's already there, because there's already a, a very significant body of standards that's, um, that, that's now part of OASIS, and consuming them into your implementations as, as quickly as possible um, are the goals in terms of the, the current organization setup and, and the vision going forward. So I think with that, we can uh, pass over to you, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Mac. And thanks, Steve. Uh, Actually, just before I flip on, I'll just you know key in on this. You know, inside the OSLC member section at Oasis that we see here, there's you know the steering committee, and that's clearly up and going. But that technical committees box, as John alluded to, we're um, we don't have any of those yet, and that's one of the uh, top orders of business that we need to do. We actually need to start doing the technical work in, in Oasis. So that's uh, that's what we'll look at next here. The uh, technical committee creation plan, and especially, um, you know, I guess, we'll focus most on the first one that we'll, do it, we'll be doing. And if you look at here, that's the OSLC core technical committee. And this is the one technical committee that was actually written right into the rules of procedure or the proposal for the member section. And uh, the core technical committee will take on a uh, role very similar to it to what it, uh, the core work group has today, and maybe maybe even identical, but this is really ensuring that there's a consistent architecture and uh, across all the various domain uh, standards or specifications, technical committees that will be doing work, so that stuff works together, interoperates well, has um, you know, it follows a similar uh, philosophy and technical strategy, and uh, that is really where the uh, where the major focus where we are now, and what we're going to be trying to drive um, into creation, as we'll see in a, in a minute uh, by by October. But beyond that, we've got a whole bunch of domain specs, and we'll also be looking into those. Uh, there's existing domain specifications at OSLC covering a, a fairly broad range of topics um, related to ALM, related to uh, service management related to um, PLM, and all those things need to find, over time, a home at, at OASIS. Which ones we get there first um, really needs to be driven by, um, I think in a large way, by the interest and the uh, um, involvement from the members in the member section. Uh, and as well as all those existing things, we know that there are there is interest in whole new domains. Uh, so new domain work may, may be also something that we need to get started in affiliated TCs inside of, 
of the OSLC member section. So let's take a look at the plan for, for core. And as I said, this is the one that's a little more uh, a little more firm. If you look at the uh, at that previous slide, you probably noticed that uh, the the little boxes become a little more transparent as we go on. I'll just, you know, it's because we're a little little uncertain. It's subject to change, and that's all going to be refined with input from the members of the member section. But with core, we're fairly good. We know that we knew we needed to create this one when the member section was uh, um, was founded, and so what we're trying to do with that is. Um, align the uh, the ultimate creation. If you if you uh, look down on the second line, which is around mid October this year, so that it will be able to officially launch. It will make use of the Core 3 spec, which is actually being worked on right now at Open-Services.net. Uh, it will be able to take that as a starting point, as an initial working draft, and then um, you know improve upon it and uh, make sure it's uh, well reviewed and well understood you know, over the next year then year plus before it can become an an actual oasis standard now this is we've got a good starting point there's a seed of work to be done here but i think as even the experience at uh, w3c with the link data platform shows where there was a portion of the core version 2 spec that was felt to be very uh, generally applicable and valuable to anyone doing linked data. That uh, that was contributed as the seat, but you know that happened over a year ago, and they're again just getting into the um, the last call uh, for comment. So and so there, you know, this is not a, a rubber stamping, and that's definitely one of the um, one of the things that we think we can't help. Um, it's probably going to be impossible with such a great. Um, diversity of members participating already uh, and of course more organizations welcome to join in the uh, as we go ahead on this work that um, we really do think that what's contributed from core three will be refined and improved by the work inside the core technical committee at Oasis and uh, we're looking forward to those improvements so as I, I won't go through all the various um, the various details of this plan. The, the highlight is that the core, or the charter, the proposal for creating the uh, TC will, we're hoping to make that by the uh, beginning of August. And uh, if the core, uh, core st standard, the core work, the OSLC core is interesting to you, uh, now is actually a, a great time to be involved, to get involved as we uh, need to iterate over the, what that charter says, what the scope of work is going to be, and uh, that of course gives you a chance to be a founder of the core TC. And uh, it, when you're trying to you know, justify that uh, activity, maybe to your uh, line of business folks, when the core tech, or when any TC is launched at Oasis, there's a press release associated with it, so you. You would get to participate. Um, you may you may get to participate in that and uh, be named in that, and um, certainly be uh, named in any links off of that to the um, to the uh, technical committee page. And um, so that that may be reason for you wanting to participate in core, or a reason that you can uh, give to your business people so that you can go and do that because it's interesting to you. So beyond core, there's, as I was mentioning, all of these different uh, domain uh, work groups that already exist at uh, openservices.net. Uh, and of course, there's the user groups that are working on scenarios, and those may be driving in um, the need for new TCs to be created. There are external initiatives that are already underway, making use of, of uh, OSLC core. and they may themselves drive need for new new work groups. And uh, any interest that you have, so even if there's nothing already started already, it, it may turn out that uh, as members you have particular interest in some field. It might be project management, as, as Mick was mentioning earlier. And 
you want to get some work going so that there can be a, a TC that focuses on OSLC for project management. That might be something you're interested in. So all these things will uh, contribute to the kinds of technical committees we have at OASIS. And also beyond core, everything else is unordered. So there's no, um, you know, there's nothing to say that this proposed change in configuration management TC is what's actually going to go first. Uh, it may be member interest might be there in order to drive the, to drive that to be first, but it could be that say the automation uh, work, which uh, which allows a wide range of or simplifies automation in a wide range of scenarios, uh, both for um, things like text case ex execution as well as you know, deployment of uh, images into a cloud environment might be, uh, might be what is, is most interesting to the membership. So that's really going to determine. We want to make sure uh, that as a community, as the members of this member section, that we are um, setting the right agenda. And, uh, and I think that uh, we will next to actually talk about some of the different ways that uh, that you can help to set that agenda. Um, you know, are there questions at this time about this this plan, or does anyone else here um, from the steering committee especially have uh, points that they would like to add on? Well then, I think, John, you you have the next. So we, we alluded to this at the start, um, but the, we talked about the update, where we're going, and the, the steps that we know about so far, at least in general. And this last section is just enumerating a range of possible ways um, for you to engage. You know, now that you um, have joined the member section, or, and I guess the first bullet <laughs> uh, that we have here is, if you haven't joined, it's an opportunity to join the member section and be, be part of this. Um, as, as we go through these, we'll realize that we're not trying to be exhaustive, but, but indicative and motivational. So if something else comes to mind on a way to participate, um, feel free to do that. The real focus here is on uh, engaging, um, getting the community to a place where it's effective and can do the things we need to do. So let's, let's go look at this set of possibilities. Um, so the first thing that Sean mentioned earlier is uh, we're going to expand the steering committee. So participating in that election, either by uh, offering yourself as a candidate, um, or if that's not the case, ensuring that um, you share your input on who would be a good uh, steering committee member is a valuable way to engage. Um, we then go on and um, need to create these technical committees. And so being a co-founder of the core uh, technical committee is, is a good way to, to contribute and engage and become part of that activity, uh, sharing your input, and whether it's on the requirement side, the specification side, um, understanding uh, what's needed, and just uh, being part of that process. If we go back to that organizational chart that we showed earlier, it reflected a range of um, other things that we can do. So um, at openservices.net, um, you can uh, get, your, get your name listed there in, in that organization's page by uh, completing the members agreement. Um, we have these user groups that there's a few created already, um, one in mobile, one in uh, system space, uh, but we can create more of those. So join an existing one or propose another one. Uh, that might make sense to help work on defining scenarios. Join a work group um, to take the um, the current specifications and help move it forward. And you can do that while we're in this process of getting the technical committees up and going. Because at OpenServices.net, uh, we have the existing work groups, so you can participate uh, in those and help get them in a place that they're ready uh, for the Oasis transition. Then the additional new work, um, and this is the, the final thought here that we were drawing attention to. If you have ideas of other things 
that you would like to be doing, not just theoretical things that could possibly be done, but something that's important to your organization uh, and to you personally. You think a certain work group is important or we think we should engage and uh, make one of the uh, current ones. Um, it should, we should create the uh, technical committee there sooner. Um, let us know that. Uh, let all of us know. It's one of those cases where when we can talk about we and us, that's all of us here on the phone and, uh, and those who didn't join as well uh, and are listening in to the recording. It's all of us are part of this. So share your thoughts uh, and how you would like to engage and where you'd like to engage and help us uh, do that uh, prioritization work. You can share that on the, the mailing list and the, the forums that are linked here. So feel free to share those thoughts. And again, if you have other ideas, ways to further uh, make people uh, aware, community growing ideas um, or other technical ideas, feel free to share them. You know, when, when I look at what is the value of OSLC, there's those two elements, and I think they're so important, but you need them both. You know, one is we need a vibrant and active community of people um, defining, evolving, and consuming what's being built here, making OSLC the place that people come to think about and make progress in their integration solutions, in our integration solutions. Uh, but then there's this quality aspect, which is that the technical elements um, and the supporting content around it um, makes sense, it's consumable, um, and it's enabling uh, this community to thrive. And that symbiotic relationship between the community and the results the community is uh, producing is, is what we need here. And your participation uh, in furthering um, both aspects is of critical importance. So with that, I don't know if there's some other thoughts to share here on participation. Otherwise, maybe we can open up uh, the discussion a little bit um, in a more open-ended way. I don't know if that was your thought, Sean, to see if we have questions of any any flavor at this juncture. Yeah, ab yes, absolutely, John. And I'm going to unmute all the lines, and uh, no one will need to worry about pressing star six. So just speak up or type in the chat. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. And I'm going to hop over to monitor on the uh, on the chat as well in case stuff's coming in there. While we're looking for more input to sh to, uh, to come in, this point that Sean made earlier about our um, the desire for the work at OSLC to be done in a, a flexible and adaptive way. Um, the freedom that that provides, right, it lets all of our input matter, but it does require that participation to occur. So this is one of those cases where we want to listen and hear um, so, that, so that we can steer in a way that is, is useful to all of us. Um, and so that, that leads to this desire for engagement uh, and input and we, we all find different ways that we, we like to share our thoughts. But I, I just want to encourage people to um, communicate as you find comfortable, you know, whether on a call like we have now, but if, if forums or mailing lists are a way that more naturally fits, please share your thoughts. It's really important to us as we move forward. Okay, I do see that there was a, a backlog of a few questions that I will uh, I'll speak of re-ask and then uh, uh, ask if you, if I'm missing questions, ask them again in the chat, please. But just so the specification work, is that going to happen at Oasis or at, in work groups like it is now? And uh, I, you know, I think what we were trying to show when we, um, when we gave the vision, uh, the organizational vision, is that ultimately you don't see any work groups over here at open services.net and we simply have technical committees at OASIS. But that isn't going to happen overnight. That's going to take some kind of plan like this, um, and it will be a phased, uh, phased transition uh, really going, going through uh, 2014. So we're starting, we, we know for sure we're doing core, and we want to get that there by uh, October, and we, we can then 
work to do these as there's there's interest and does it uh, make sense in terms of the where the actual specification work at at um, open-services.net is. But one of the thoughts was that it made great sense that uh, that the B3 or the version 3 of the spec work gets done and uh, so that we don't try and uh, do this move in the middle of that, get that complete, and then, then use that as the seed, the, um, the initial contribution into the work group so that they can um, they start from that point and then work to improve it. Okay. Um, we did mention the landing page. Okay, so another question. If you want to keep uh, participating in defining the specs, you have to get you have to become an Oasis member. And if you so if when you say defining the specs, you actually want to be involved in uh, the discussions about the um, the vocabulary that's used, the, the the resource shapes, and those real essential technical parts of it. Yes, you are going to need to be an Oasis member. Uh, because all of that work will continue inside the um, inside the or it will continue inside the technical committees that are to be created. If you're interested in the specification uh, scenarios or the scenarios that drive the specifications, that's an activity we think can continue inside user groups out in, at uh, open-services.net or even elsewhere, any, anywhere that a group of people are coming together and um, discussion, discussing scenarios, those can all be things that drive, um, that drive future specification work or standardization work at OASIS. That said, uh, we need people, uh, uh, we're, it's easier to come up with scenarios than it is to agree on standards, and so we, we really do need people doing the, the real work, being interested in seeing those scenarios um, being standardized. So it's important that, uh, you know, at least if there were a half a dozen people uh, or organizations talking about, talking about certain scenarios inside a user group, uh, to really make sure that the key scenario from the user group actually gets standardized, you know, most effective would be that one or two of those participants would then um, also participate in work at Oasis. And there's work, Sean, just to add to that. So you have the user group uh, scenario requirements formation. You have the work happening in the work group itself, um, which requires um, OASIS membership. And then there's additional work in terms of um, organizations or open source projects or researchers, anyone, in individual companies, uh, implementing um, consumers and providers of these various specifications. Um, that, that's work that's also very important. It's critical affirmation uh, of the specs, ensuring that things are on the right track, um, that they're working uh, in practice, and that feedback loop's important as well. And that's something that's, that's outside, again, of um, the work group context, that, that consumption. Yeah. Any, anyone can do. Yeah. And you know, when we look at how we've been working today, and one of the uh, – the major uh, connections between um, between the, the specification work and the Eclipse Leo project is that as the, um, the spec authors are trying to confirm that what they what they're working on or what they're specifying what will become a standard is actually useful and can work, they do things like creating reference implementation and they. They may build some libraries to simplify that, and they work on it. They've been working on test suites as well. So, well, none of this is uh, this is going to be strictly required, or none of this Oasis strictly requires to be done. We do think that the technical committees will continue to work in that way, and uh, people who may not be uh, Oasis members and but have an interest, perhaps they uh, were involved in and some of the scenario definition, this would be a place where where they could connect in and, and help out as well, uh, as well as 
validating them through this kind of work that the scenario that they gave, that they helped define, actually is solved by the, uh, the, the proposed specification or standard. And uh, so there was just a mention of, or a wonder if this is, if this is going to be recorded. And uh, yes, it is. If you go to the open-services.net uh, open website, uh, on the resources page, it provides a, a large number of, of resources. It gives you the links to the Eclipse Leo project, the OSLC for Net project, um, tutorial. But also, it has this section on presentation. And if you click in on the one for today's talk, which is the virtual kickoff, you actually see We've got the slides already there in, in PDF and PowerPoint. And once the recording, uh, once the call finishes, the recording will show up here. It will be posted onto YouTube, but this would be the place you could go uh, to find it and direct people to. And they would be able to get both the video as well as the, um, uh, the song. Are there any other questions? There are t 10 minutes left in our time. If, um, if you're interested here and want to especially learn more about OSLC in the context of uh, the cloud and uh, DevOps, uh, Steve Spiker is actually giving a, a talk right after this one on, uh, on that. Uh, it's here you can... Uh, Again, from the uh, presentations page, you can find the link to it and the registration link. It actually starts at 11 a.m. and I bet Steve may have already dropped to go join it as he's presenting. Steve will be leaving. Then um, John, uh, Mick, I think uh, Reiner may be on the call as well from the steering committee. Are, are there any last uh, thoughts you'd like to close off with? I'll go first. This is this is John, and I'll let Mick and Reiner add their their thoughts also. Um, first, this. We again appreciate and want to say thanks for your, your interest and participation so far, and we look forward to ongoing interactions. Uh, second, find ways to work in providing um, and making this community more valuable to you. Um, we're not asking for altruism here. Um, the, the value that, that we have found in, in our participation is it's, it's useful to our organizations, and it, it's moving us all collectively forward. So, so find ways. Uh, that are valuable, and then and look to engage to make that happen. Uh, feel free to reach out to us individually, uh, if that makes sense as well, um, if you're looking for ways to explore opportunities and, and see things um, that make sense to, to your organization, to your project. Uh, and we'd be glad to be a sounding board on some of that as well. So, again, thanks for, for listening, and uh, look forward to ongoing interaction. Yeah, and this is Mick. I'd just like to quickly second what John said. You know, if you're to encounter an, an integration need, you've usually got two around the life cycle. You've got two options. One is, you know, start making unrest protocols and and building things up from the ground up. Uh, I think we, you know, want to make sure to encourage you to look at these specifications because a lot of work and thought has gone into them, and there's a lot for you to build on. As John mentioned, it's not about altruism; it is about um, building on and then evolving. Uh, a whole so that we can all differentiate our solutions on, on top of that. So um, I think, yeah, I would again encourage, it, you know, anyone, you know, making, whether you're making a new tool, you're making a new layer, you're making new UI facilities, um, just take a look at, at the specifications and what's there because there's, there are things that are, are relevant to be building on there already and that sort of thing will continue to grow. So. Reiner, anything else, then? Uh, no, there's not much to add from my side, but I would also like to thank all the participants to, of the call today and all the listeners to the, the recording. And again, if you want to get involved and you don't know how, just reach out to us, and we are very 
uh, you're very welcome uh, to to uh, contact us and we can help you to set up a user group or to get involved with other things and if you have questions um, find the, the appropriate uh, mailing list on the on the open services net and and contact us thanks okay well thank you thank you again to the uh, steering committee members to all the participants in the call today and to everyone who's listening uh, Please look us up at uh, open-services.net or also oasis-oslc.org, the member section home site. And uh, we look forward to working with you. I hope I will uh, see some activity on the mailing list with uh, thoughts as to what you want to do or, or on the forum. Again, if you grab the presentations, the links to all of that are actually clickable inside uh, both the PowerPoint and the PDF version. Thank you again. Have a great day.